Good evening, everybody. I am JP Burlington, Director of Admission at Trinity Pauling School, and we are coming live from Pauling, New York uh, for our Pride Perspective conversations with the community. And this is uh, one of our first of the summer series. We've had a, a wonderful group of webinars uh, with some great panelists uh, since April. All of those webinars are on our website. It's the Pride Perspectives right on our uh, homepage. You can get to it from there. And these have been, as I said, just great opportunities for uh, families just like yourselves who are joining tonight to hear from our faculty, to hear from our alumni. And tonight we're lucky to have uh, a, a group of, of men who come from many, many different uh, walks of life in terms of their college experience, their coaching experience, and they're gonna uh, get into that in a little bit. But uh, before we get into tonight, I just wanna let you know, for those of you who um, may be enrolled at Trinity Pauling, uh, we are gonna have, uh, or thinking about enrolling at Trinity Pauling, we're gonna have a great conversation on uh, July 15th, which is right after the uh, holidays. And it's gonna be a Q&A with our school leadership, uh, just talking about the road to reopening in September. Uh, we're also gonna have a, uh, the headmaster has a book club that he's done uh, and he's got a second book clubs coming up in uh, the middle of July. And the book is The Book of Joy, Lasting Happiness in a Changing World. And so please, if you're interested in that, uh, you can register for that. And we have a couple more throughout the summer before the start of school. Uh, but as I said, we're happy that you're here. Uh, and as you know, if you've been on webinars before, there is a Q&A button on your screen. You can ask questions throughout the evening, and we will get to those uh, as quickly as we can. Obviously, uh, there have been some nights where we haven't gotten to all of them, but uh, you can always email me and or uh, anyone on this call. Uh, you can find us all on our on our websites. So without further ado, I, I would love to uh, have all these coaches introduce themselves. And uh, we're going to, uh, I think we're going to start out with Coach O'Keefe, and then uh, we'll go around the computer, which I'm sure it's all different for everybody. But we'll start with uh, Coach O'Keefe. Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, Tyler O'Keefe, uh, head men's lacrosse coach at MIT. Uh, played college ball at Springfield College, uh, got my graduate uh, degree there, was a GA there for two years, uh, did a year in Memphis, Tennessee at Rhodes College, two years an assistant at Williams College, and uh, became the head coach at MIT three years ago. Great. Thanks, Coach. Uh, coach Chesney. My name is Bob Chesney. I'm the head football coach at Holy Cross. Uh, I actually spent my first years at Norwich University. Coach O'Keefe, I actually coached lacrosse there as well. We played you guys. So I, was, I didn't know a whole lot about lacrosse, but I knew you guys were really good. That's about it. After that, I went to Delaware Valley College, and then I left Delaware Valley. A uh, couple other stops, but then I was at Johns Hopkins University for six years. And then after Johns Hopkins, I had an opportunity to become a head coach at Salve Regina University in Newport, Rhode Island. And I left there and went to Assumption College, which is a Division II school up here in Worcester, Massachusetts. And now I am over at Holy Cross. Uh, obviously, you guys do an unbelievable job here. And, and Khalid Exum Strong, I don't know if he's on this call or not, but, but uh, you know, that, that, the caliber of you know, student athlete that you pump out of this school is something that I think all of us coaches at the next level are very appreciative of. That, that young man is a special young man in many different levels in many different ways. And uh, I was blessed to be able to work with him for a couple of years. Thanks, Coach. Uh, coach Devaney. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Jeff Devaney, the head football coach at Trinity College. Uh, I'm a Trinity alum, so blessed to be the head coach at my, my own school. I coached at the Coast Guard Academy, University at Albany, Georgia Tech, Central Connecticut. And I've been at Trinity for 20 years now. Uh, and we have a couple of Trinity Pauling players on our team. And John Gerard will be one of our captains next year. And if he has any kind of year like he's had the first three years, he will break a bunch of records at Trinity, which is pretty impressive since we've been playing football since 1877. Awesome. Uh, Coach Laff. Thanks, JP. Um, I've been at, uh, my name's uh, Nick LaFontaine. I'm the head football coach here at Trinity Pauling School. 
Um, I've been here for eight years going into my ninth season. I also help out with uh, the track and field program, the co-head track and field coach here uh, with all my knowledge in that department. Um, I followed Coach Chesney at the uh, Norwich University, the WIC, and uh, Coach Little Cross myself. I think I took over for him. Um, the kids kept saying they, uh, this other guy didn't know what he's talking about, so it was, it was interesting. <laughs> yeah, they were right. They were right, for sure. Hey, but I bounced around. I coached at college for 11 years. Um, you know, I got to compete against Coach Devaney uh, a few times, and uh, I think Coach Devaney's home record is like, a thousand to maybe one loss at home, something like that. And, uh, and it, so it's a great pleasure to have him. And Coach Chesney's uh, won the Patriot League this year at Holy Cross and uh, went to the national playoffs consecutive years, I think, uh, at Assumption College and basically turned that program around. So uh, we got an esteemed uh, a group of guys here that have a lot of experience, and I'm excited to be on this. Thanks, Coach. Uh, Coach Harf. Thank you, Mr. Burlington. Uh, so I'm uh, Scott Harf. I've been at Trinity Pauling for five years now. I'm one of our co-directors of college counseling. So I work with most of our student athletes who are going to go on to play at the Division I, Division II, or Division Three level. Uh, I also coach hockey here. Uh, played hockey both at Brown uh, and then finished up at Colby and then played for a few years in the minor. So I have a, a little bit of insight into both sides of the, the recruiting process. And on that note, JP, I'd love to um, pick Coach Chesney's brain really quickly. Can you talk just about the general Division I recruiting process uh, that you see at a school like, like Holy Cross? Yeah, I, I can. So, you know, we usually start uh, during our winter season is when we begin. You know, when our, our season is over, we graduate our seniors and then we, we move on and, and uh, that second semester, we begin to, you know, just kind of evaluate tape and, and try to figure out and talk to coaches and learn as much as we can about each player in our recruiting coaches areas. And then we start to build out our, our boards a little bit. And then we usually use the winter time. Guys will come and visit us and see us then even in spring football, we'll have a lot of junior days that open up. And then when that's over, we'll get out in May and get a chance to go see you know, the guys that we feel strongly about play other sports, lacrosse, run track, be in the weight room, learn more about them on a personal level and have a chance to evaluate them. Uh, and then we usually have them come back and, and come to our camps over the summer. And then after those camps are done, uh, we'll also have many guys that don't come to our camps that just have a chance to come through and visit with the school. Uh, usually in typical time by, by, you know, whatever we're at right now, by, by uh, early June or mid June here, we'd have, Probably, I'd say, you know, without exaggeration, probably a thousand to fifteen hundred kids already come through our campus. We would have seen them; they would have seen us, uh, and we're, you know, pretty selective. We'd only be bringing in twenty to twenty-two kids, maybe, and uh, we'd start to sort of whittle it down a little bit. They would eliminate us; we may eliminate some of them, and we'd begin to move a little bit further with the guys that, as as our interest grew in them, as their interest grew in us, we get closer, and we we get a chance to see them maybe again over the summer at a different camp. But by the end of the summer, usually before their, their senior year, they're ready to commit before camp starts. This year, obviously, things are just a little bit different. So we've had about, I think, 12 kids visit this year by this, by this point in time right now. Very different numbers as far as who has been able to get to campus. That was all obviously before March. And um, you know, now we're just in a little bit of a different, a different spot. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Uh, could you just quickly before I hit the division three lens with uh, coach Devaney with the new division one dead period. What is that? Obviously this is new for everyone. What's that kind of project out for you going into recruiting seniors and PGs in the fall? Yeah, that makes it a little, a little more challenging, obviously, because uh, you know, <clears throat> I often say to our coaches, just find this, find the finish line on each of these guys. You know, what is their finish line? When do they hope to be done with things because if they're hoping to be done before the season, that probably means they're making decisions sight unseen on a, on a school, you know, verbally committing to a school mm -hmm. without ever seeing it and without the coaches ever seeing them, which is very interesting and, and presents many challenges, right? So I think uh, in there, 
transparency and honesty is is really important. There used to be a point in time where you would talk, I'm sure as a football coach, if you're five nine, say you're five eleven, if you're five eleven, say you're six one, you know, and, and there was always this little bit of uh, you know, boosting of your heights and weights and speeds and all those things. Uh, and it was understood and sort of accepted. I think now a little bit different, you know, there's no way to quantify that or qualify it, you know, uh, with certainty. So, you know, our job now, our job now is to reach out to as many people as we can and figure out some of those things. Is the GPA correct? Do we have a transcript? We can't be in the school like we would be in May to try to get an idea of those things. So it does, it presents a pretty, pretty significant challenge for us at this moment. Uh, and then can they, if they're not going to commit sight unseen, then when is the next opportunity for them to visit? And that may be during the season, may not be during the season if no fans are allowed at these games. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot in here that's still undecided. Um, and I think it has a lot of people undecided, confused, you know, little, little nervous, feeling a little anxious about it, and understandably so on both sides of the, of the equation. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I'm going to head over to Coach Devaney. Can you just talk about, from the football perspective, what the Division Three recruiting process is going to look like, both in a start with a typical year and then kind of hit what you're projecting for this fall? Yeah, I mean, our process is very similar to Bobby's process at Holy Cross. We, we follow the same exact timelines, the same. The only difference is in our league, we as coaches aren't allowed to go out and see kids off campus. So we're not going to a kid's high school and, you know, talking to him in person and things like that. We're doing a lot of, a lot of phone calls, a lot of, a lot of kids don't answer their phones. So we're doing a lot of DMing on Twitter and, uh, you know, and we're going to, in the old days, we're going to Holy Cross camp and we're going to Yale camp and we're trying to see kids in person there. And obviously we can't do that now. So we, just like Bobby said, we just had a, actually had a staff meeting in my backyard yesterday. I, I think coach brought their own lawn chair and we socially distanced and, and we basically my staff's job the last couple of weeks was to find out which kids are going to make a decision by the end of August and which kids are going to wait till the end of the season because we we're basically want to treat those two groups differently. We have to be a little more proactive with the kid that's like, well, I'm, like, I'm going to make a decision, like Bobby said, sight unseen, because those kids that want to make a decision in August, which there are some out there, not as many as I thought, to be honest with you, uh, they're going to have to do it maybe without visiting the school. And so how can we figure out a way to be more personal with those kids? How can we figure out what those kids are all about? Because to, to be honest with you, we're missing out on those, all those in-person evaluations. The camps to me, I mean, yeah, the 40 times and the pro agilities and whatever, that, that doesn't mean as much to me. Getting to see a kid compete and getting to see how, how a kid behaves and getting to see how a kid interacts with a bunch of kids he's never met before. That to me was a huge evaluation piece that we're gonna currently miss in this class. Absolutely. Well, and coach, that's it's a great kind of uh, segue to a question I have for you. Um, you know, how do you demonstrate a recruit's character or leadership? You know, obviously that's important to all, to all of you, but if you can't see them in a camp and, and how is, how are, how are you able to see that aspect of, of an athlete? Um, and and what, what are you doing now, especially this, this summer or, you know, going into the fall? What, what are you thinking about for character and leadership? Well, that's a great question. I think, first of all, we're going to, I think when you watched the NFL draft last year, you saw way more focus on high level, like Alabama type kids that Nick Saban recommended. I think as college coaches, I personally am going to rely on high school coaches I trust. Like I know Nick LaFontaine is going to be honest with me about a kid. So I am going to, there are a lot of high school coaches that aren't honest with college coaches. They just want to sell their kid. So we, we will probably be tapping our recruiting class a lot more from high schools that we trust the coaches. We're going to do Zoom meetings with kids and their families and I just don't think it's as easy to evaluate a kid's personality from that setup as it is watching him compete at a camp. Right. And then the last thing I'd say is just, I, I say this to my staff all the time. When I call the kids on the phone, like how do they, how are they on the phone? Are they enjoyable to speak with? Can we actually have a conversation with them? Is, is it painful to try to have a conversation with them? Like I think a lot of kids are going to be evaluated by how they handle phone conversations which 
a lot of 18 year olds are not comfortable having a phone conversation. Right, right. Uh, Coach O'Keefe, uh, going back a little bit to the, the recruiting aspect, um, one of the questions that came in is, you know, how is COVID-19 affecting the recruiting? And we know that uh, at least for mo many sports, uh, I've heard that lacrosse, there are going to be some potential show showcases or tournaments. Uh, you know, our, our coach Kirkaldi was talking about Delaware and, and things, but how is it affecting, you know, recruiting? Um, are you seeing showcases this summer? Um, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, where can I start? Um, there, there's a lot that's been affected uh, by COVID-19 throughout the, for the recruiting process. I think when it comes to lacrosse specifically, yes, they're gonna, there are gonna be some events that are going on. Um, you know, they're being advertised now. They're definitely gonna be modified. Um, you know, how are they gonna be modified? You know, that's to be determined. Um, I know number of days, number of, of kids is, is something that's going to be going on, but uh, it's also comes down to um, coaches, right? So, um, you know, like myself, um, you know, I, I'm not supposed to be out on the road representing MIT. Um, it, you know, we, we have a travel ban. Uh, I know there's some coaches out there that have been furloughed and, and aren't the same thing, aren't allowed to be out recruiting. Um, that's where the virtual, you know, is going to come in. Uh, I know a lot of these events have said that they will be recording, um, and I'll, I'll pull up my, uh, my, my chair and get my water bottle and put some sunglasses on and sit in my house or sit outside to get the feel of, of being out on a field. Um, but again, you know, like Coach said, uh, we're going to lose the live aspect of that. But I do think there are a lot of, uh, especially Division three schools that are going to be out there um, that are going to have some luxury of, of recruiting. But um, I also am interested to see, I, I don't know, I don't have a direct answer right now of the training um, that's going to go on and, and how the play is going to be. Are we going to be allowed to have contact? Um, I've been over to a, a couple of club practices here recently in the last week and, you know, no more than 10 kids on a cage, uh, you know, no contact with coaches. Everybody's got to wear a mask, no contact with players. Um, and, and it's, really hard to evaluate somebody uh, when you're not playing, you know, contact in a, in a contact sport. So um, I think there's, uh, again, there's going to be a lot of um, changes and, and I think we all have to be ready to adapt um, even throughout this schedule. You know, um, I know that it's being said there could be events right now, um, but, you know, events can get pushed back, events can get canceled. So. I, I'd love to ask all or hear all three coaches perspective on this. So as I'm listening to, especially from the coaching side of things that just like the student athletes, we're all unsure of what is to come. Coach Chesney, I'll start with you, especially from a Divi division one perspective. Do you think that a student reaching out now and being proactive becomes even more important than it was in the past? It's always important, right? I think that it's just always important to, to have that line of communication to try to figure out maybe where you fit in on that board. Because the finish line of each kid I, I mentioned before, you also have a finish line in your class. So if we're taking two safeties as an example and one commits, well, that just speeded up, you know, sped up for every other safety that we have on that board if, if they're interested, right? So things, the dominoes start to fall a little bit. So to sit back and, and wait and expect those coaches to find you, they will, but at the same time to not, you know, reciprocate that conversation is, you know, never going to help anything, right? I think it's about how much information can you get them? I, I'm the word I used today that coach, I said, we got to try to quantify, right? The unknown at this moment, right? There's a lot out there that we don't know about, but we got to find a way to quantify it. A lot of kids are doing virtual combines and sending that video. They're getting, they don't have the SATs or ACT scores yet either though. That, that a lot of that did not come out yet but everything we could quantify that we don't know about right now that we would normally value in a decision, we need to try to quantify as quickly as we can. But that does, that's a two way street, not only a coach reaching out to you, but if a player does, or a, you know, student athlete does have something new, a new grade to send you a new uh, 40 time to send you a new wingspan to send you their weight, standing on a scale, their height, those things, as much as you could actually have information on the better off you're going to be, but that does, that has to come from, from those guys reaching out because those camps and all of that is now, you know, not available to gain that, that information. 
And and with just for our juniors and seniors who are attending tonight for the division, the current division one dead period, they can still reach out to you. Correct. They can't. Yes. They just can't be on campus. They could be on campus. Just can't be on campus and us interact with mm -hmm. them on that. Right. campus. So. JP, did you have a question? Uh, Coach Devaney, from, in terms of your virtual visits or um, the virtual combines that Coach Chesney was talking about, can you just talk about what options are out there for r the rising seniors and PGs that we have? And then kind of how you're at the Division three level looking at those and evaluating student athletes through that. Yeah, at first I would uh, I would agree with Bobby about the the uh, being proactive. I mean, our staff meeting yesterday revolved around kids that have been super proactive with us, some of whom we've rated highly, and so we're very interested in them. And because they're showing that proactiveness, that's going to lead to us offering them and doing a lot of work with them. Some of them that we haven't rated that highly, but in a sense because they've been pr so proactive, they're forcing us to do some research and decide whether we're going to we want to take them or not you know um to your next question i think different programs are treating this this situation much differently there are some programs that are doing tons of zoom meetings and tons of that that type of setup we at trinity have not done a lot of that yet and we're really holding out hopes that because at trinity we're still saying that we might be able to have small groups visit us in latter part of July and August. And so we're still holding out hopes that we can meet people in person on campus. And we're trying to, you know, trying to not do the awkward, huge group Zoom meeting with recruits. If we can af afford to bring people to campus, if we get to the point where there's no way we're gonna bring people to campus, what we're gonna do is do individual Zoom meetings with kids and their families. We're not gonna do the old, like, you know, have 50 recruits on a Zoom meeting. I know there are some staffs that are doing that and, and some kids find that to be helpful and some kids find it to be awkward. Absolutely. Tyler, could you mention your, you are watching some live game film uh, in terms of a highlight tape that you're seeing from lacrosse players. Can you just speak to what effective ones are versus ones that, um, you know, you're, you're getting and evaluating, but certainly aren't giving you a good, glimpse into what that student athlete can do. Yeah, I think, um, well, I'll, I'll speak kind of for lacrosse, uh, but I, I don't know if coaches can, can chime in if uh, they agree for football as well or, or any other sports. But uh, for me, um, length uh, is, is a big one for, for highlight tapes. Um, I, I don't need to see a 15-minute highlight reel, um, you know, keep it, you know, between – three to five minutes is, is fine. Uh, appropriate music would be great um, as well. And, uh, you know, just, I would say put in um, the important plays, uh, you know, as a defender, you know, specifically, right? I, I don't need to see you carrying the ball in your stick and running up and down the field. Um, I want to see you actually play defense, uh, you know, attackman. Uh, I, I don't need to see you, you know, pick up a ground ball and, and, and make a nice pass. I, I want to see you dodge. I want to see if you can feed. I want to see, you know, your quickness. I want to see you, you uh, on the field doing, you know, showing your strengths. Um, those are some, some really important things that, that I would say. Um, and, and hustle plays, um, it's always good to, to have those in there. And make sure you provide as much info in the film as you can, you know, stating what number you are, what team you're on, uh, things like that. It, it's, it sometimes can be a little frustrating. Uh, when you get a highlight tape and you, you don't know who you're watching. Um, so those are some of the key points that, that I would say. Um, and just, you know, making sure that you do a good job editing it and, um, you know, have somebody, have somebody look it over, send it to, uh, you know, a high school coach, send it to your club coach. Um, make sure before you send it out to all those coaches uh, that it, that's good to go. And, and, and make sure that you don't just do the copy and paste uh, with the highlight tapes either. Make sure you know the name of the coach, who you're sending it to, and, and put a little introduction email uh, with the highlight tape as well uh, and send some, some academic info along. Uh, that'd be great. And I think, you know, another question that is, is kind of follows that, 
how early, I mean, you're talking about three to five minutes of, of, of film. Uh, and so, you know, how early is too early to start, um, you know, getting film on kids? Uh, you know, is it, we have some seventh, eighth, ninth, 10th graders on this call, uh, you know, being a, a defenseman in lacrosse in the ninth grade is going to be a little bit different than uh, their junior season. So how would you characterize that? Yeah, I think it's similar to uh, as uh, coaches were talking about uh, a timeline. Um, you know, you, you can send me a highlight tape if you'd like of your, your freshman year. Um, I, I'm going to be completely honest. I don't know how much time I'm going to spend watching it. Uh, I might take a little glimpse at it and, and give you a little evaluation and, and get you into our system. But, you know, our focus is on that, that junior class um, going into their senior year through that summer um, is our biggest timeline and then going into the fall for us. Um, so, you know, I would say fall of your senior year, spring of your junior season is when, when I'd like to be seeing some tapes, maybe going into your junior year, um, from your sophomore year that summer. But, um, anything earlier than that, I mean, obviously be happy to evaluate, get you into our system, um, you know, get you, get you to fill out a questionnaire, but, uh, you know, I'm really focused on my timeline and the guys that I have, um, you know, but uh, I think the line of communication and, and starting an early conversation is, is, is healthy. Um, but I wouldn't expect a ton of communication all the time from, from any coaches, right? Because um, again, we all have different timelines and we're set on our timeline and we're focused on the guys that we're trying to bring in for that following year. And then uh, just to follow up, I think, you know, uh, Coach Loff, I'm going to uh, throw just because of your knowledge and expertise in, in track and cross country. Um, there's a, uh, a question out there about, um, and this might have other, you know, similar to maybe a 40 in, in football, but, uh, you know, video of track and cross country. Is it just, should kids just be sending coaches just times or watching you know, a two minute, you know, 200 yard or four, I, I, I shouldn't even set a time, but you know, what, what's, what's more important to college coaches in terms of, you know, just the times or some video as well? Um, that's a good question. Again, like uh, my, my, I would defer to Jim McDougal on this, our co-head coach, but um, you know, the times are important. I think it's really important to see a kid run as well. So if, if it's primarily running, there's going to be a technique issue. Um, you want to evaluate that, something that, you know, just like in other sports, can you fix that? Or is that something that the kid's going to, you know, that's going to happen? So um, is there potential for growth? Um, that kind of thing. So I don't think it needs to be, again, like uh, what Coach O'Keefe was saying. Um, you know, if it's going past a few minutes, then we're coaches probably are not watching it at the college level, I would say. Um, so but it is good to see some sort of technique and, and, and see you running, which, you know, the great thing about this time period is that you can do that. Like kids can go film themselves, run, you know, mark off, uh, you know, hundred meters or 200 meters, whatever, um, if they don't have access to a track, but um, you know, they have that advantage to do that now. Great. Thank you. Coach Harf, you want to. Yeah. Uh, one of our, uh, one of our coaches actually just asked this question in the chat. Um, so obviously we have three fantastic academic institutions with us tonight. So uh, Coach Chesney, I'll throw this to you, but uh, Patriot League School, great academics. How much emphasis are you and your staff putting on the academic piece of every student athlete before you're even going through um, the athletic ability? Uh, all of it, right, all of it. So I think we are gonna talk to three coaches in here that probably will say the same thing. It, none of the film matters if the transcript doesn't match, right? So for us, we have bands that we work off, which is similar to the Ivy League. I believe NESCAC's the, you know, the same. And I think that, uh, you know, it's got to fit. It, and, and it could be a great kid. He can be recruited by every other team in our league. But the band he fits in, in that position at this current time, we would love to have him, but it just won't work. So there's a supply and demand that comes along with that, but it all starts with that. There's, there's nothing else really to talk about if they don't fit into a band for us, which is uh, qualified by their transcript. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And Coach Devaney, can you just jump on in terms of uh, the bands that Coach Chesney mentioned, just the typical NESCAC school, what that recruiting process looks like as opposed yeah, to – same thing, same thing that Bobby said. I always tell my assistant coaches, don't even watch the film if you don't have academic information because the kid could be a great player on film, but if he has a 2-2 GPA, you just wasted five minutes of your life watching his film because we can't recruit him. So um, – the bands in our league are a little bit more like deans of admissions gets to make decisions and we're test optional. So in the, if you were asking me this 15 years ago, I would tell you between this a SAT and this SAT, you're going to be an A band. Between this SAT and this SAT, you're a B band. But since we've been test optional, it's much harder to tell because it, what high school is the kid attending? How hard is that high school? What course load is the kid taking? What kind of AP classes does he have? And then what is his GPA? So I always get the question, well, what does your GPA have to be? It's, it's a question that can't be answered because what classes are you taking and what high school do you attend? If you attend Roxbury Latin, you might have a 3-1, but you're going to have a way better chance of getting into Trinity than if you attend you know, some high school that's not as highly, uh, highly looked at. And, and Coach O'Keefe, from the, your league, the new map, what does what recruiting look like there from an academic perspective? Um, very similar. I, I would say the only, the only thing that's different is um, we, we don't have bands. Um, I, I think that every school in the new map actually has a unique recruiting process in the sense of um, how they work with their admissions office. Um, you know, for us, we have a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Uh, we have support. Um, you know, other schools might have one-on-one -on -one meetings, um, different support. Some might have pre-reads, some might have, um, some might use a, a scale, like a band system. Um, so they're all, all different, but I mean, it, it's going to be the same exact thing. Um, kind of uh, going off of what I said earlier about the recruiting piece, you know, that sophomore freshman filling out, you know, the questionnaire, sending a highlight tape. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times you look back through the communication and, um, you had the communication, you liked the highlight tape, and then by junior year, you know, test scores or uh, things didn't go well academically. And then again, right there, um, you know, that kind of gets you crossed off the list. Um, so I, I would say it's extremely important, uh, the academic piece and, and, and getting all the info um, and making sure when coaches ask for it, uh, being up front and, and being honest about it and, and sending in the, you know, the right stuff. Uh, cause we are going to find out anyway. So, uh. yeah, I, I cannot agree more when I think I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago on the last webinar, but one of the things I talked to all of our juniors about as they're moving into the, the summer between their junior and, and senior year, uh, if, you know, if there is a coach that they've been in contact with, as soon as that final transcript comes out, I think that's bringing up, um, to what coach Chesney was talking about, of, um, in terms of being a self-advocate that's a fantastic opportunity to reach out to a coach say, Hey coach, I just finished the year. Here's my grades. Um, and I know some students and, and parents are worried about, well, what if the coach doesn't like my grades? Well, the, what I talk to the kids about is to your point, Tyler, they're, the coaches are going to find that out eventually. And I would rather as a student athlete, find that out right away before I fall in love with a coach, before a coach falls in love with me then find out in the middle of November when I've got my mind made up and then it, it can't happen. Well, and as the, as the loan admissions officer on this, you know, I think it has a lot to do with the right fit and knowing, you know, again, knowing where you're looking and uh, as, as coach O'Keefe talked about, I mean, the new Mac, you know, Wheaton college is in the new Mac. And by the way, great, great place, uh, class of 99. Um, but, uh, that's a very different admissions process than MIT. Uh, there's, there's no, you know, two ways about it. So it's, you just, you have to figure out as, as a junior, uh, sophomore, whenever that process starts for you, obviously it starts junior year here at Trinity Pauling, but know the schools and, and do the research. Uh, don't just fall in love with, uh, I'm, I'm going to go play football at Alabama. Most likely you're not. 
uh, and it's uh, to do that, do that research. And that's another question that kind of feeds in perfectly. Can I, uh, JP, yeah. can I interrupt and just ask, yeah. follow up with Coach Devaney? Coach sure. Devaney, we as advisors, uh, we have an advisory system here. Coach Harf is uh, integral in that. Uh, but you touched upon, you know, that fine line, you know, if you're at Trinity Pauling and have a 3-1, or if you're at, you know, Joe Q Public School or wherever. Um, but a question we get asked a lot is, you know, how hard, how, how would our, our headmaster would ask is, like, how vigorous of a schedule do you need to take? Um, should you take the five APs? Should you have some sort of mix? You know, what's your advice there, Coach? I think it's more important that you have B's or better on your transcript than that you bury yourself with too many difficult classes. So while it's great to challenge yourself, you don't want to challenge yourself to the point where you're getting C pluses. Uh, you know, and anything below a solid B kind of gets frowned upon in the admissions world. And Nick, while you asked that question, and, and JP, you're, you're talking about the process too. I'd be remiss if I said, and this isn't as important for Bobby because he's got scholarships, but for us, those of us who don't have scholarships, if you're entering the recruiting process, I always tell families the first thing you should do is find out what your EFC is, your estimated family contribution. You've got to find that number out because that number is going to tell you what it costs to go to MIT or Trinity or Yale or Princeton or Amherst. So if you're going to end up with a non-scholarship school, a need-based school, you're going to have to pay your EFC. And one of the most frustrating things that we deal with in the recruiting process as a coach, but also from a parent, my, my senior, my oldest daughter is a senior in high school. So I'm dealing with the same process right, right now is if you don't know what your EFC is. So let me say, for example, you make $150,000 a year as a family. Your EFC is probably forty-five dollars to $50,000. That's a lot of money for a family that makes one hundred and fifty dollars and if there's no way that you as parents are gonna pay that money, don't bring your kids to need-based schools because your kid will fall in love with one of the schools and then you will have to, as a parent, sit down and say, I know you love that school, but we can't afford that school. So before you even get into the academic piece of it, find out what your EFC is, find out as a family if you're comfortable paying that EFC, and if you're not, you have to stay away from need-based schools. You have to look at merit-based schools and scholarship-based schools. So it's not just the academic piece. The financial piece is a huge part of it. And uh, just to clarify, uh, estimated family contribution uh, is, is the EFC. Um, but that, that's, you know, that's a, a big aspect of, of this, of the boarding school process and, and obviously the college process. Um, a question about, uh, you know, again, talking a lot about the right fit, uh, where to look, but question that came up, how many schools should an athlete be considering entering into their junior year, uh, especially, you know, if they're not, if they're not at a place like Trinity Pauling, uh, if they're at a, at, a, at a high school where they might not have the support that they need. What would you, what, what's a good starting point? Uh, Coach Chesney, what, what would you say, you know, is a good starting point at your junior year? And then when is, if you put your college counseling hat on, when would then be the process to kind of start narrowing down that search? Yeah, I, I think as soon as you could get started with visiting places, you should be doing that. Even if it's sophomore year or freshman year and you're driving. I remember my father, we'd go on trips and we'd go by a college and we'd stop right? And we we just go walk around it, find the football field, you know, do those things. And uh, whether it was accident or on purpose, we were starting to gain knowledge of bigger schools, smaller schools, you know, what uh, schools in the country, schools in the city, those, I wouldn't worry about a number, I would worry about a type. And I would try to find myself different types, right? And if you're not sure, right, if being in a city is, is for you, go look at a school there and get a feel for what that is like, right? And if you're not sure of anything, make sure you diversify, right? And you, you get a chance to go around and look at as many different types as you can. If you're sure you want a city, 
Well, now you already narrowed it down. If you're sure you only want to be two hours away from home, you're already narrowed down. It's, it's truly a narrowing down process when it comes to it. Obviously, you can only go to one. You're going to look, you can look, the, 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 the hard part about now is I think you could go back to, you know, you graduated in 99, so you're coming out of high school in, you know, 95, and, and you're going to look at that and say, okay, well, what is, we would get a, we'd actually have this book in the guidance counselor's office, and you'd flip through, you'd find how many people, student to teacher ratio, if you were lucky, you had this little black and white picture that existed in that book, and you could go, oh my God, I, I know everything about this school by that little picture. Well, now there's virtual tours that you could, I mean, you could sit in on a class, you can do anything. You could almost, you could do anything but eat in the cafeteria. You could go in the cafeteria, you just can't eat in the cafeteria. You could do almost everything at these schools, which makes it very confusing and very hard to narrow down. But it's important for you to do those things if you're unsure. Start to figure out where you might want to look. And I always think when I go in and see, I think I was in Malvern Prep High School down in Pennsylvania, and it said something on the one guidance counselor's wall, and it said something like, college is not a, like a lottery uh, winning the lottery. It's a match that needs to be made. And I thought that was important because as I watched those kids, they'd say, I'd say, who are you interested in? And their number one answer is they give you who's interested in them. And I always go, wait, I'm not saying who's calling you and recruiting. I'm saying, who are you interested in? And very often these guys don't have any answer. They're like, well, I'm just waiting to see where I get a scholarship. I'm waiting to see who comes after me. I'm waiting to see who recruits me. And that's so such a bad decision. Right? I think the best thing that you possibly can do is be proactive and go find those schools that you like for your reasons. If they like you, great, make that match. If they don't like you, you may still like that school anyway. It's up, it's up to you in the end because it's a, it is a you know, life-changing decision, as we all know. It's crucially important. And I think from 14 to 18 years old, it, you don't grow more physically you go through a pretty big change and you, you won't grow more physically, but 18 to 22, you won't grow, you won't grow more spiritually. And I don't mean that in a religious sense, unless you want me to mean it in a religious sense. I mean it in truly who you are, right? That 18 to 22 year old, you know, kid, it can't be about we're sponsored by Adidas and not Nike. We have a nice field. We're purple instead of being green. It can't be about any of those you know, superficial surface things. You got to really ask yourself what you like about each and every school. What do you want from that school? And then go find that match. But it can't be surface. It can't be social media driven. And it can't be because your uncle told you you should go there because he went there. It can't be that. You have to be the one to make the decision for your, your own reasons. Because in the end, all those people that you're trying to impress on social media, they're not there. You're the only one there. So it's got to be the right decision for the right reasons. The transfer portal is more popular now than ever because people make what they perceive to be the right decision at that moment at 17 years old, but it's for the wrong reasons, right? So what is, what is the reasons that are going to allow you to be successful in that school when those tough days show up? Because there's tough days that always show up and what is going to get you through that October cold, rainy day, where maybe you don't make the travel squad for the football team, you did poorly on a test, your girlfriend broke up with you, and you're homesick, right? What is going to get you through that day? Not signing day, how many people, you know, liked my commitment video that I made. Though that You got to dig deep here, and you got to start to truly know what you're looking for, so you know what you like. I, I as the uh, resident college counselor in the room, I could not agree more and give you a rousing applause for that. Um, uh, in terms of what we're doing at TP, uh, if there's new students here uh, or uh, prospective students or guys who we haven't worked with directly in the college office, um, I'll use, you know, Joey from uh, Coach Loft's football team. When he starts with me really in the middle of his junior year, I work, as I said before, I work with a lot of our student athletes, but when you're in the college office, we're talking just to, to coach Chesney's point, we're talking, do you want to go to a big school, a big school in the city? Do you want to go to a big research university or do you want to go to a small rural school like I did up in Waterville, Maine at, at Colby? Um, and, you know, within the geography, the size, um, what the campus looks like, what do you want to study? Because, you know, as much as we're, we're all, uh, there to play sports, we, we also, a, a big part of our, a big part of the student athletes time on campus is being a student. So we have to make sure all those align. And what, what I feel very passionately about and make sure that 
I'm pushing all of our students to do is we really make two lists. Certainly do I want to know which coaches have reached out to you, which lacrosse coaches, which hockey coaches, which um, squash coaches. But I also want to know if you're just a kid and you can't play school, it's the old, you know, you tear your ACL test, excuse me, can't play school, can't, can't play sports. Um, where do you want to be? And a lot of times there's a, there's a great deal of crossover between those two lists, but in the college office, we're, we're talking, you know, we'll go through all the NCAA stuff and make sure you're eligible. And, you know, we're constantly in contact with Coach LaFontaine for football players or Coach Castle for basketball players. But it really is, to Coach Chesney's point, it really is. You've got to figure out what your fit is as a student before you're making any choices. And that's something that, not to toot my own horn too much, but I think we've done a very good job of in the past uh, at Trinity Paul, he's making sure that our guys are moving on to, to schools that they fit well, whether they're a student athlete or, or they're, they're not an athlete at all. Um, on, in terms of visits, um, a question I thought of is how can, and I'll, I'll send this over to Coach O'Keefe, how can parents best support their sons through the college recruiting process? Uh, I would say Parents, um, I mean, you kind of said the key word is, is be supportive um, and listen. Uh, make sure that, you know, I, I think sometimes parents can, can talk a lot and, and, you know, have a lot of influence over uh, their children. Um, but it's also important to listen. Um, I think sometimes mom and dads out there really want, you know, uh, little Johnny to go to MIT because MIT is a great school or go to Trinity because it's a great school or Holy Cross or, you know, um, but the question comes down to, does, does little Johnny want to go there? Um, and that's, that's really important is, um, allowing them to, you know, speak their mind and, and tell you how they're feeling and, and what they need support on. Um, and the other thing is to, um, you know, just, just try to help them as far as getting them more information, uh, being there to listen. Um, also, you know, coming on a visit, I think it's important. Um, if you have questions to, to speak up and, and, and understand that obviously as coaches, we're here to, to answer your questions as well. Um, I will say from the perspective, um, and I don't speak for all coaches, but from my perspective, I, I am also interested in, in talking to your son or your daughter, um, you know, from, from the standpoint of recruiting, like I, I am talking to them and recruiting them. Uh, yes, it's very important. You know, they're going to be in great hands when they get here. Um, but I, I'm not going to have a conversation just like I wouldn't have a conversation about playing time. I'm not going to have a conversation about why, uh, you know, you're not our choice as, as our third attackman coming in on a recruiting class or um, why you didn't get in or, or anything like that or how did the admissions meeting go. Um, that inf information will be, you know, between your son and I, and he can kind of relay the message. And if there's any concerns, uh, obviously, I'd be more than happy to pick up the phone and, and, and chat. Um, but I think just being supportive and listening, like I said, and then also, um, you know, giving them guidance and, and giving their, their, your opinion and helping them, you know, with, with testing strategies and, and, and school and uh, extracurriculars is a big thing for us. So, um, you know, I know parents do a lot. Um, and I think it's also important to, to give a shout out to them and make sure that, you know, their sons and daughters are also saying thank you on the, the flip side. Uh, I always tell our, our guys, when we break it down, uh, whether I'm at a recruiting event or whether we're at MIT at practice, um, you know, make sure you say thank you to your parents. Um, if you haven't called mom and dad in a couple of days, make sure you do that. So. That's great. Well, speaking of, of supporting uh, Coach Loff, you know, one of the questions that came in was, what is Trinity Pauling doing uh, to make their athletic program more visible to college recruiters? And, and I know you, you do a lot with, with your college coaches, but if you could touch on what Trinity Pauling does, it really our athletic program in general. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that I think we do really well, and um, this goes across all, um, all sports um, with all the coaches, and now, frankly, with the assistant coaches, like Scott Arf's the assistant hockey coach and still does a lot with the recruiting process. Um, our job, that's part of, that's a big part of our job. And um, again, like it's something that we take a lot of pride in um, and something we work really, really hard at. So I think navigating it in a normal year 
uh, I always tell the kids it's a process and it's difficult and you have to take, um, you have to take it uh, one day at a time. Um, but during this COVID thing, one of the silver linings has been that we've had more time to reach out to coaches. Um, again, your home, we, we, we had the uh, remote learning for attorney polling, but um, I was able to crank out emails every morning to coaches. Um, Coach Devaney's probably got 14 emails from me somewhere in his inbox. Uh, Coach Chesney as well. Um, where we just kind of are sending out our prospect lists. Hey, take a look at these couple guys. To let me know what you think. Um, and, and I know other coaches are doing that as well. Um, whether they have the prospect list or they're c calling coaches that they know or, you know, touching base with, hey, this kid's coming in with our incoming postgraduates, our incoming uh, students that we're excited about. Um, hey, I just updated the list because we just got this guy. Um, and then that conversation continues. And, and frankly, uh, we, we got a kid um, from a, a school this year because Coach Devaney called me and said, hey, we got a guy and um, we know or we think uh, this kid is a great kid. He needs another year. And for us, that's like one of the best ways to get a kid because we know that there's college interest. You know, the placement's going to be a little bit easier. And frankly, you have a college head coach kind of verifying his character. So again, from our perspective, that's, that's a huge thing. Um, Nick, just not to butt in on you, but I love that kid. So he better end up at Trinity next year. <laughs> don't tell Bobby about him. What's his, his name? What's his name? What's his, is yeah, that you, the one you, you sent me next? You're not, you're not, you're not interested, Bobby. You're not, no, no, I got you're it. You're not interested. <laughs> um, but specifically, like what we're doing, um, again, like, so Kyle, we're, we're always reaching out with schools. Um, you know, I, I bother these guys all the time. We have uh, a Founders League virtual showcase that we're going to do. So uh, football, just recently we joined the Founders League, um, and we're going to do a showcase there uh, virtually and try to file all of our kids and try to basically get the information that Coach Chesney was talking about as far as, like, the tangible stuff, like wingspan and height and and, and, and get, get that out of the way. Uh, and then and you can look at the – um, you know, Coach Chesney can look at, you know, him do a broad jump or Coach Devaney can look at him do an L drill or stuff like that. So we're working on getting that going um, over the next few weeks. Um, we also have a great tool in sports recruits um, that the school subscribes to, um, which it makes it so simple and easy to reach out to coaches in a very efficient way um, where you can go through their interface send an email if you put in uh, MIT and, and this would be for every sport. So obviously think of football, but I signed us up uh, one of our juniors for track this year and he was reaching out to kids uh, or, or to, to coaches. And uh, it makes it easy because it populates the coaches uh, names from the school. So if I typed in MIT lacrosse, um, you know, Coach O'Keefe would pop up and his assistants and then they could send it out. It also puts up a profile that coaches can look at and, and that makes it easy as well. So um, it's, it's, it's an entire team effort from our perspective, um, from Coach Harf's office to the specific sport, um, you know, the head coaches and the assistant coaches, um, you know, to, to the teachers here that are writing unbelievable recommendations. Um, so uh, to me, it's a whole team process and uh, it's something that we really take a lot of pride in. And, um, and again, like trying to find that great fit for, for your son. But JP, can I jump in really quickly? Yeah. Um, the, the only other thing I'd add from a, a Trinity Pauling perspective here is, you know, I think having Coach O'Keefe, Coach Devaney, and Coach Chesney here speaks to the relationships that our coaches have with other college coaches. So, you know, the fact that, that Coach Loff, uh, I already thanked him profusely in person for this, but I'll thank him profusely publicly. The fact that he was able to so quickly get Coach Devaney and Coach Chesney on a call like this tonight, that speaks to the relationships he has. And then um, I think Coach Devaney, you brought it up earlier, but as you guys are, are out on the recruiting trail, trusting a guy like Coach Loff, I, I think that relationship speaks volumes. Um, and, and sports recruits is great, but I think that, that our 
our relationship that we have as coaches at Trinity Pauling, um, that's one of the biggest avenues towards uh, college sports for our student athletes. Scott, I totally agree. I mean, if you're looking at Trinity Pauling, I can only speak towards the football aspect of it, but we, college coaches, we really, after a while you learn which high school coaches you can trust and which ones are just trying to sell you their kids. And Nick has always been very honest with us about what kids would fit at Trinity from a talent standpoint and a personality standpoint. You know, whereas we're dealing with other coaches, quite honestly, coaches that you guys compete against that are telling me that this kid's a scholarship kid. And I'm like, there's no way that Coach Chesney is offering this kid a scholarship. You know, so I think being able to play at a high school where the coach understands the recruiting process and what is realistic, that is by far the most, you can have all the bells and whistles you want. <laughs> the most invaluable thing is having a coach that understands what is realistic as far as college recruiting. Yeah, there, there, if I could add something, there's also, Coach Loff has an inside track a little bit, right? He's been in your league. He's been around the college game. And, and it, I think a lot of coaches don't mean to do it either, you know? So sometimes you're like, man, he's just really far off, but I don't even think he knows he's far off. It is the best player he's ever coached maybe in his life. But, you know, that is that school and that, that area, or whatever the case may be, still not good enough maybe for what some people are, are looking for. So I think it just kind of gets skewed when it's your own kid, just like parents on here, when it's your own son, it's hard to imagine anyone being better and not someone not wanting your own son or someone not wanting a player from your team. So there is some emotional connection that goes with it. Uh, but these are sometimes business decisions without emotion involved. Well, and Coach O'Keefe, there was a, a, there was a follow-up to the, the conversation Coach Loff was having about sports recruits. And, you know, as I think as families, they love it. And it's, it's great for the actual athlete. But what, what would you say, and I know there are other types of uh, programs like sports recruits, but just – listening to what coach Devaney said about relationships, how, how is sports recruits to the coaches, you know, for themselves? Is it more really an athletic, an athlete thing, or do some of the coaches and you all can answer this, but do they use it as well? Yeah, I think there, there's a, a ton of different platforms that, that in different services that a bunch of different coaches belong to uh, or have access to. Um, I think that, you know, I, I would say I, for me and myself, I, I use it as a tool that's something that, you know, um, I, I don't go in every day and look at the database. Um, I, I know that there's some coaches that are, are very different. They might go in and, and do a specific search. Um, you know, obviously for, for, you know, from an academic standpoint, uh, I'm looking at the, the transcripts and the test scores and things like that. Um, you know, and I, I obviously – NESCAC schools and a, a lot of high inst academic institutions uh, are, are going to do the same. Um, I would say that if, if it works um, and it keeps things organized um, for families, then, then I would continue to keep using it. I know that we get a lot of communication for it and uh, it's easy for me to look at profiles and, and respond to, to messages and things like that. But as coach was saying, you know, um, as far as is, you know, videos and, and things like that. I mean, a, a phone call to a coach is, is going to go a long way. Um, and I know sometimes there's coaches out there that, um, you know, you, you don't have a relationship with yet or, or they're new or you're a new head coach. Um, so you're going to use other resources, other coaches, uh, maybe people from certain areas um, to, to get more info. But um, whatever platform, you know, that, that works for you and your family uh, that you can use is great. I think the most important thing is, at the end of the day, you want to be in your coach's database. So I know there's a lot of coaches out there that will ask you to fill out a questionnaire, um, you know, and, and, and put as much information as you can in that questionnaire. Cause that's usually our, you know, our database is what we're going to go to. We're all going to have different ones. We're all going to have it, it sorted differently. Coach said, you know, uh, says he brought up um, recruiting boards and things like that. So ours are broken down that way. So we're not using sports recruit as our database but it is a good tool to have. Great. So um, I think we're going to have 
one last question here, and um, it's going to go to Coach Devaney, and um, we're going to try and not, you know, we're going to leave Holy Cross out of this conversation for just a second. But uh, so as a student athlete, uh, leaving Holy Cross and other D1 uh, schools out of this conversation or, or, or some, looking at a NESCAC or a school like MIT, what's the importance of choosing, you know, a higher academic institution playing D3 um, as opposed to maybe pursuing that D1 school um, that might not have that same, and this is why we're keeping Holy Cross out of the conversation, that same high academic standard as a Trinity or an MIT? It's a great question. I, I always look at it as you're making a, a lifestyle choice more than anything. And you could even include Holy Cross in this because Holy Cross is a great academic school, but your lifestyle choice at a Division I school is going to be very different than at a Division III school. And I, I'll give you this, this is the best example I can give. In my 15 years as the head coach at Trinity, we've had 118 players study abroad. So probably about 75% of our juniors, their junior spring, they spend the semester in Rome or Paris or London or Shanghai or Australia. We don't have spring ball in the NESCAC. So while our kids work really hard in the off season in the weight room, it's all voluntary. I'm, I'm putting air quotes around voluntary. But um, I think it's more, it's a lifestyle thing. And we've had kids tell us that their dream and their dream is to be a division one player. And that's what they want their college lifestyle to be. And they might never play, but they want to be, they want to do spring ball and they want to be in that world. And that, Who's to say that's wrong? That's what they want their lifestyle to be in college. So to me, it's a lifestyle thing. Now, when you start talking about academics, that's, that's totally different to me. Like if a kid's looking at Holy Cross or Trinity, they're academically very similar. The lifestyle's just different. But if a kid's looking at a NESCAC school and a Division I school that I won't name that is not so strong academically, now it's a lifestyle thing, and it's a where do you want to be when you're 30 years old thing, you know, because what job opportunities are going to be available for you with that NESCAC degree against that other degree, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, other, other coaches want to chime in on that or, you know, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Um, well, it's just interesting because coach, you asked Coach Devaney that, and we actually had a kid um, – that's on his roster right now is a great, great kid um, who had that choice, exactly that choice where he uh, was getting recruited by some division one schools that are great places, but maybe not uh, as academically uh, strong as a Trinity. And um, again, like what, what kind of what coach Harf was saying um, and we were talking about is at some point in the process, we looked at him and said, what do you want to do? Do you want to go to the best school you can get into or do you want to play uh, at the highest level you can play at? Um, and uh, he made a decision. He said, I want to go to Trinity. I want to go to the best school I can get into. And um, to me, that was a really mature decision at his age. Um, because again, like it's ultimately their decision. And I think our job is to guide them um, and help, but we can't make that decision for them. Um, and to me, like, that's a huge, huge thing. And, uh, you know, he, it was just an interesting point because he, he actually made that exact decision, and I thought it was the right one. All right. Well, we have uh, we've taken up your time and, and these wonderful uh, webinar tuning in, uh, the families, uh, the, the folks from off campus, uh, from different walks of life. Thank you so much for joining us. I am actually gonna ask the panelists to stay on uh, just for a couple minutes um, as everybody else uh, heads off. And I know that's difficult because people just kind of linger a little bit, but we're gonna try and uh, have our six panelists stay on for just a couple more minutes. Um, but before everybody leaves, thanks again for tuning in. Uh, this uh, Pride Perspectives, a conversation with the community summer series continues on as you uh, will see on our website. So please uh, tune in over the summer. You can obviously reach out to any of us uh, in terms of Trinity Pauling. 
our college counseling office, our, our athletic department, admissions. If you have any questions throughout the summer, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, and uh, there are, as we all know, there are rules about reaching out to, uh, to college coaches, but um, you know, come to us first and, and we'll, we'll help you out in that process. So thanks everybody, uh, have a safe summer, stay healthy. And uh, I know this is, this is hard to do, but if everybody could sign off for the night, uh, we would appreciate it. Thanks again.